north of the Ohio Valley, a steel mill in Beaver County lies dormant. A few years ago, the haze around LTV Corporation's Aliquippa Works was a haze produced by billowing smokestacks. Today, the only haze surrounding the mill is the early morning fog pictured here. The plant, except for two departments, was shut down nearly two years ago, and now retired hourly and salaried employees face the loss of health and life insurance and pensions. Pennsylvania Representative Joe Coulter calls Aliquippa a veritable modern-day ghost town. Good afternoon, I'm Donna Petcash, and today we have with us members of Solidarity USA. To my left here is the Reverend Jay Geisler, and then Joe Casuccio, who is an officer with the organization, and William Orlowski, a retired steelworker and a committee member. Welcome. Nice to have you with us. Nice to be here. Can you tell me a little bit about how Solidarity USA started? Well, it basically began last year after they had the Save American Jobs Day that was in June, and it didn't seem that Congress responded and the media itself didn't respond. And then in July 17th, LTV Corporation decided to declare bankruptcy. And on that day, they declared bankruptcy, but the most significant thing was they cut off unilaterally everyone's Blue Cross and Blue Shield. And immediately, a grassroots organization sprung up initially in Youngstown and then moving very rapidly to Aliquippa, Pennsylvania, called Solidarity USA, which is a foundation of workers, both blue and white collar, to defend their rights, especially in regards to pensions, uh, retirement, Blue Cross, Blue Shield, all types of benefits. So it's basically blue and white collar. What were the reasons that LTV gave for cutting off their pension? Well, initially the main reason was is that they were underfunded and of course the steel crisis, that was their main reason for it. Now why they cut off the Blue Cross Blue Shield unilaterally, uh, initially that was met with a great amount of uh, turmoil. In fact, some people even uh, started to uh, attempt to block some of the gates down at LTV and then what eventually happened was that the union got involved and of course it eventually went to Congress itself and Congress said that they must reinstate that and so the Blue Cross Blue Shield for the workers has be, been reinstated and will stay in effect at least until May at this point for the Blue Cross Blue Shield. And then of course now we have the whole question with the pensions and with the uh, Pension um, Benefits Guarantee Corporation taking over. There's all kind of questions that still need to be answered on that. Okay, Mr. Casuccio, you've been involved with the union for a long time. How did you feel when all of this happened? Did you feel betrayed? Yes, I did feel betrayed and I thought what they did was, like the Reverend said, was outrageous. I never saw anything like that. I worked for JNL for 40 and a half years, and I never heard anything like that in my life. And people really were despondent over what happened. I was, I was receiving many telephone calls, and when we started Solidarity, I was one of the first ones to join. Now, what do you do with Solidarity? What are your main functions? What types of day-in and day-out things do you do? Well, uh, we go and try to tell the people exactly what's happening. The people do not know the truth. Everything they're hearing on the radios and on the, on the news medias, it's wrong because they're saying, for an example, theoretically, in a way, they are right. They are saying that seven, this affects 7,000 employees on the supplemental of 400. It doesn't affect 7,000. To me, it's more like 30,000 because you have to take in consideration the wives, the children, and, and the, the grocers, and all the ways down the line. This is affecting everybody. In time, it's going to affect the whole country. What people don't realize what's happening, and we've got to stop this. We're not people that we throw stuff around or anything. We're good, hard-working people that we think that we deserve what we got. Okay. Mr. Orlowski, do yeah. you agree that Aliquippa is a ghost town now? Yes, I do. Now, there's a lot of circumstances here. Like I say, these people that retired, they took this early retirement. They took it in goodwill because the company told us that we would receive our pensions and our gas supplement until we would turn 62. Now they turn around and tell us as of uh, September the 13th, which was last Tuesday, they told us that our pension plan was being turned over to the PBGC. January 13th. I'm sorry, January the 13th. Now, this, for the six people that are 62 and up, it doesn't uh, hurt them too much because they'll receive their Social Security plus their pension. But the people below, 62 and down, those are the people who really would be hurt because most of the people retired when they were 52, 53. Now, they won't receive as big as a pension because their pensions will be cut because it's based on the amount of years they are 
whole they are, I'm sorry, not by the amount of time they have in the milk. Now, a person, like I say, at 53, he was receiving, uh, let's just say an example, $800, $900. That includes the $400 supplement. Now, as of July the 13th, Jan January the 13th, I keep mixing the day up, January the 13th, they will no longer receive the $400. Now, a person that received $800, they'll receive $400. Now, I don't know how possibly a person, a family, could live on $400, because in one year that comes to $4,800, if my math's right. Now, I don't see how they can make their house payments, pay for their life, I mean, medical, not medical insurance, uh, electricity, water, and sewers, and certain things like that. This, all, this is below the poverty level. I don't know what the poverty level is, but it must be around 7000 When they receive $4,800, like I said, if they make their house payments, which is about $200 a month. By the time they pay for electricity, which is about another $100, it, by the time it's all over, they'll own the, they can't possibly make the payments. Now what about um, wives going out to work or going out and getting part-time jobs? That is great, but the that? minimum wage is what? Three? Seventy-five. Three, all right, okay now. All right, now if they have a family, most of them do because they retired early. They took it in, like I said, they thought the company would take care of their pensions till they were 62. All right, if the, fam the wives go to work, naturally the husband will stay home. But how much possibly can a wife make? And like I said, there's no way that they could keep up. I just hope that the states and the governments have enough money, because you know what's going to happen eventually? All these people will go on welfare. And I don't know, I know for my part, I'm a little bit ashamed to go on welfare, to tell you the truth, because I worked, like I said, I had 33 years in a mill, and I worked hard, and I always figured that when I retired, I could relax and enjoy life. And I told my wife when I retire, our children will all be grown up and on their own way. I thought I could spend time with my family. What I mean is my wife, and we could relax. Now, I don't know from day to day what's going to happen next. Okay. Mr. Casuccio, do you think that this problem was brought on by the company itself, or do you think, a lot of times you hear people talking about union workers, they were greedy, they wanted too much, and they took it all, and now that's why there's nothing left. No, this problem was brought on by the company. They call them LTV. To me, it stands for lousy, treacherous vultures. I hate to say it, but it is the truth. Mm -hmm. Because I've never seen a company like this. Let me give you a story of background, what actually happened. In 1981, I was on another channel, and I asked Mr. Malcolm Baldridge this question. He said that they were coming in 9% imports coming into this country. I said, Mr. Baldridge, you better read a little on further. I said, it's 13. He stuttered and he stammered. And that, they have tapes of that. You can always get that if I'm not telling the truth. And uh, okay, so I said, you know what it is today in tubular products? 80% of the tubular products are being imported into this country. Well, now that is part of the government's problem. Why don't they stop this so our people can work? Not only in Aliquippa, in the whole country. Let the people work because the people are in this country, that's what our forefathers and everybody was based on. So they worked. In 83, as a committee man, I saved the company $9.6 million on what they called was the Greenfield Remanning. And I saved the company. In 84, and, and we put people on pensions and etc. on the supplements and everything. And now these people are suffering today. And I feel slighted because it happened like that. In 84, they came around and asked me, they can't work the mills because we need another $5 an hour. I said, only off of my department? I said, you people have to be sick. They said, yeah, because we're not making no money out of your department. We're hurting. And I, says, and I said to them, I said, you mean you're going to try to segregate my department from the rest of the mills, which is a seven-mile mill down in the Yellow Football Works? I said, nothing doing. I would never sign nothing. So eventually they shut us down anyway. So they were going to shut us down, so we didn't lose nothing on that. In 85, I had a feasibility study with the company. Mm -hmm. In this company, we tried to open that mill back up. The company will not go along with it. And don't let them tell you any different. They use all of that mill that's not working as a write-off. And what about just last week something came across the wire about a man from California might be buying out part of those works to make He's a new product? He's buying out the 14-inch mill, which is now working. It's the same thing that's working. So really, it's not going to create more jobs. Okay. All it is is going to get it. And that's another thing I want to say. How come they waited till after the PBGC fund took over to sell that company, to sell that man the 14-inch mill? 
you got to think about things like this. And, and then in 86, the solidarity was formed, and we took over. And we're not doing anything wrong. All we're doing is trying to help everybody. And Donna, what's going to happen, I'm going to tell you the truth. This is going to blossom to the Teamsters, the auto workers, the miners, every union in the country, and everybody that has a pension. Because in a few years, if they don't do something right now, this will be depleted. There will be no, no pension plan. It's an alarming. It's very alarming. And these people do not understand what's going on. So that's why, yes, we need money. We need money for mm -hmm. certain reasons, for advertisement. And we go on jaunts on the buses. We don't have good times. We do our thing, and that's exactly what, why we're here. Are you getting you support story. from the federal government and from the state governments in Pennsylvania and Ohio? Are you getting support as of this point well, for your organization? Well, there's been certain individuals, for example, Heinz has come out and said he wants to know why they didn't have a you know, mass meeting or a public meeting over this whole question of the pension funds and just pushing it off in the government. They did that without actually having some kind of public discussion. And we've had people like uh, Coulter and uh, Charlie Lachlan. These are local politicians who have been very involved. But that's in Pennsylvania. And then also we have Metzenbaum in Ohio has been very active. But it's been real scattered, and it's been put, you know, we've basically been put in the back burner. And I think the big thing that Joe pointed out is these people who work, let's say, 30 to 40 years, and all of a sudden it comes time for retirement. And what's to keep other companies from saying, well, we're sorry, we don't have enough pension funds for you. We're going to push this off in the federal government. Eventually, they keep pushing these off in the federal government, and that uh, right now, that uh, Pension Guarantee Corporation is underfunded to begin with. In fact, they're estimating that the $8 per month for each employee that's put into that fund now is going to have to be 10 times as much. Now, that's just some rough statistics that I heard, but the whole fact is you can't have the federal government paying for everybody's pensions. Mm -hmm. We need more people working. That's the bottom line in this whole thing. The triangle of work used to be that you had the majority of the people working and a few people retired with the whole question of the baby boomers getting older and, and there's a lot less work and the pay is a lot less. It's reversed itself. And so the majority of people are elderly and there's very few people working. And because of that, that system is going to collapse eventually. So there's no hope for someone like me that's just starting out. Well, I think, that, don't they have that where you put the money away in the IRA? I think maybe some people are starting to do that. Uh-huh. Okay. But I think the big thing is this is the start of a long process of corporations trying to get rid of their pension funds and trying to push them off in the government. And eventually, you'll have to pay for it. They'll have to pay for it anyhow and increase taxes. Okay. When we return to News 9 Index, we'll look at some inside stories. What are these steel workers actually going through in their lives right now? January 25th, you're having a Solidarity Day of Prayer for Distressed Workers. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, I think the biggest thing is uh, we forget that this country, in a sense, was founded on prayer. I'm sure that George Washington and the troops in Valley Forge were on their knees a good number of times, and I think that's what we're at. We've been driven to our knees with this whole question of the steel crisis and the LTV bankruptcy and that. And this is a problem that's really affecting this country. And so the ministers, the uh, shepherds of the flock, in Aliquippa in the surrounding area are gathering together and we're going to have a day of prayer and this will be this Sunday and of course what we're going to do is we're going to hope that we can get the people inspired to get behind this group and uh, the English poet Alfred Lord Tennyson said the lo more has been accomplished with prayer than the world will ever know and so each time we go I usually lead them in a prayer when we were down at Washington I had the honor of praying there right there on the Capitol steps and you know, we've been praying I, I think this is a you know, it's not just dealing with the money. It's also dealing with the dignity of the workers. We forget that. Here's men who have worked 30, 40 years. They worked during uh, World War II. They worked during Korea, Vietnam. We put a lot of soldiers into the field to defend this country, and all of a sudden they're being discarded like they're some kind of used product. And that's what we're here for. So I think there's a real spiritual basis about this, the dignity of the worker. And that's what this is all about. There's no blue collar, white collar. It's workers standing up for their rights, and I'll tell you what, by the time this is done, this is going to change the face of this country. Either that, or we're going to see ghost towns all across this country. How are the spirits of the people that live in Aliquippa right now? What are you seeing day in and day out? There's a sign down there that 
somebody scratched some graffiti. It says, survival is the best form of protest. So you can imagine how bitter some of the people are at this point. And that's what we're at. We will not die because we do believe that our God is behind us and the dignity of workers since you know, Adam and Eve, the first thing Adam did was he started naming the animals. The work is inherent to mankind and that's what we're all about is you know, providing places for men and women to work. And I think that uh, ideally what's going to happen is we're going to realize that if our country doesn't work, it's going to die. And these people are the best workers and like just even coming into town, everybody's so friendly. All these mill towns are like, they're willing to help you. They gave us directions to get here. And we're going to stand up after we hit our knees. And after we hit our knees and pray to God, we know he's going to be with us. How willing are these steel workers, the, the ones that aren't retired, to be retrained? Um, isn't there an attitude among some of the younger ones that my dad did this, my grandfather did this, even my great-grandfather might have done this. The country owes this to me. Isn't it a little bit of them owing something back and going and being retrained and willing to change? Or do you think that's an attitude that's been ingrained in them, that they deserve this rather than <coughs> words? Their fathers took it as they were lucky to have a job and they were grateful to have that job. Don't you think there's an attitude problem there? Well, I think with some people there are. For example, I'm from four generations of steelworker and uh, you know now I have job security. But I mean, I don't think too many of them are going to run off and become priests. So um, basically what's going to happen is I heard it put pretty concisely. The people that are in the, uh, the steel mill towns, they're either going to be retrained, they're going to retire, they're going to seek some type of re-education, or what's going to happen is they're going to die. I mean, that's the bottom line. I don't see uh, a great change. For example, Al Kripa had about 30,000 people 10 years ago, now it has 15,000. My father, for example, went back and got a real estate license. But not everybody's capable. Some of these men don't even have a high school education. And they're trying to get a GED. And you have all these workers who are laid off, and they're all competing for these minimum wage jobs. It's a difficult situation. Like I said, those that can relocate have. Those that have retrained will. But some people are not capable. What do we do with them? And like my friend said, we let them die? I mean, that doesn't sound to me to be the great American dream. Mr. Casuccia, do you think the steel industry will really revive? Do you believe that in your heart? Do you think it will come back as yes, good as it was they, before? If they call us in and ask us, we'll help them all we can to get these mills back on their feet because I'm a dedicated fellow. I tried in 85. I said I was in the feasibility study, if you heard me, and I, I'm willing to go back and get these people, talk to these people, and I know we can do it. Please believe me. It wasn't the steel workers' fault or the unions. It was the company. Not because I was a union man, because I know what I'm talking about. And I, and I, and I have to pat the unions on the, on the back at what they're doing, because if it wasn't for them, our, our um, major medical benefits wouldn't have been extended to me, because when they threw up that picket line at Indiana Harbor, you have to pat those people on the back, because everything they're doing for us, I greatly acknowledge it and like what they're doing, and I'll, I'll go to bat. And I'm not militant towards the company, but I know what was said, I know what they did, and I'm sorry I feel that way. Thank you. Mr. Orlowski, are people working together in Aliquippa and in Beaver County to bring about change? Yes, they are. They really are. Like I say, people they are trying to really educate themselves. I know people are trying to go to college, but like in my case, I'm 57 years old. I was thinking about going to college. It'll be a two-year course. Now, by the time I get out, I'll be close to 60. Who could possibly hire me at 60 years old? I mean, there's a lot of people coming out of colleges and schools. They're a younger generation. They have to fill these people's jobs first because, after all, they have families. They're trying to get started in life. And I think the biggest thing here is loyalty. I know when I started at uh, LTV, which was Jane and LNN, which I graduated from high school, Ambridge High School, in 1950. Now, I went straight into the mill, and I put two years in the mill in there, and then the Korean War broke out. As good steel workers, most of them volunteered and went into the service. They went and fought for their country. I spent two years in the service during the Korean War. I came out. I went back into the mill. Now, like I say, there was a lot of people. They worked hard. They, they, they was dedicated to their families. I know of people. In fact, I was one of them. I got hurt in the mill. I had my finger cut. I cut a tendon, all right? And what I did, I was so loyal, and I'm not bragging, but like I said, I was so loyal to the company that I was operated on in the morning. I went to back to work in the afternoon. Although I sat there for two days, in other words, and then I filled in on one 
arm job. But here's the thing. I was operated in the morning. I went in the afternoon just so LTB or JNL wouldn't have a lost time case because that was a big thing during the mill. They didn't want lost time cases. So I thought I'd put it, like I said, loyalty is the biggest thing. And I think the steel workers are really loyal. And I think the company owns them something. What do you think that Aliquippa has to offer to revive itself? Well, I think the biggest thing is the people here. These are real good, hard working people. And the other thing that has helped us and hindered us is the news media. The news media is, has helped us in the sense that they've been willing to pick up. But in the local area, for example, Pittsburgh, here we are from Aliquippa. This is the first time that we have been on the news as far as any type of interview. And we really thank Steubenville for having us down here. But on the other hand, in Pittsburgh, this move for high tech, it's like, well, let's forget the steel workers and move on. And they just refuse to die. And there are good, hard working people there. And also, of course, you have seven miles of idled mill. You know, if nothing else, eventually that's riverfront property. It will be valuable again someday. But to me, the most valuable resource of Aliquippa is the people. And uh, when we went to Washington, the, Word Aliquippa is for an Indian princess. And she owned basically all the Pittsburgh area. And local legend has it that when her and George Washington met, sparks flew. And when we went to Washington, that's what we said. We want Aliquippa and Washington some sparks to fly again so that we can you know, begin to ignite this great industrial machine that this country was, that was the envy of the world during World War II and in the 50s and that. And so I think Aliquippa is going to be the spark that starts us to look and say, hey, industry is important. We can't just be a service service nation. Now has your group been doing any charity work or what organizations are working with these families that are having problems? Well the Catholic Church, uh, I'm from the Diocese of Pittsburgh and we've been real involved and we have a, a task force on unemployment and it's like some of the statistics that I came up with we use from that task force. For example in Alquipa 30 percent of the people are unemployed, 50 percent of the people are underemployed. In other words they're taking jobs that are far less than their skills or their educational levels. We have uh, groups like the Salvation Army. We have a group called the Fisher Folk, which is an Episcopal group. It's a religious organization, uh, religious community. They've come to live in Aliquippa, and they've started some renovation. We're working with the grassroots. There's the St. John the Baptist Church that we've been using their halls to have different rallies and that. So we see all the churches uh, organizing. I know, for example, we have a St. Vincent de Paul Society, and we've been handing food out to the poor. Uh, Beaver County Unemployed Committee, I was a founding member on that and they have some, uh, oh, for example, spaghetti dinners and that, and they're helping to defend the rights for retraining in that. First of all, some of those men have been denied retraining in that, and so that Beaver County Unemployed Committee argues for TRA, for readjustment in education. So we're still hanging in there, and like I said, you know, survival is the best form of protest for us. Why have they been, some of the men, been denied retraining? Well, for example, what had happened was that they got laid off at one time, and it turned out that the way some of these extra funds work, there was time periods involved. And the, quite, for example, these are steel workers; they're not bureaucrats. You know, it gets real confusing filling out forms to become, uh, you know, re-educated and things like that. And so, something like the Beaver County Unemployed Committee is helping them to fill out the forms. And you know, these men get desperate, and then you say, "Here, we'll retrain you," and they put a, you know, a 50-page stack of paper in front of them. And these guys you know, have worked in the mill and, you know, basically a lot of hard work and you put them there and they're confused. That's, you know, they'd rather go out and dig holes or, you know, uh, load cranes or do something like that. And then you say, well, here's what you have to do. And you have all that bureaucracy in that. So we're trying to help re-educate them so that they're not afraid of the forms and things like that. Um, you're accepting donations, aren't you? Oh, certainly. From, from our listeners. If you would like to donate to Solidarity USA, you can write to the Aliquippa Chapter, Box 1427, Aliquippa, PA, 15001. If you would like to have a speaker to talk on this issue, just like these gentlemen are today, you can call 412-375-1598. Now, who will they be talking to when they call that number? Well, they'll be talking to uh, our secretary. Yes, the secretary, Rita Mudry. And uh, also, you know, any of us are available to speak because we think this is an issue that's not going to die. And I think the biggest thing is you realize all this is grassroots. All our funding, none of it comes from the government or from the local government or anything. It all comes from the people. Five dollar donations, ten dollar donation. I have a little red box that I keep and we talk about it now, equip and that. And people after church shake hands and slip me five dollars, ten dollars. And uh, we gave $1,000 for that Beaver County Unemployed Committee. Initially, I gave them some money to start them off. But all this is a grassroots effort. It's truly from the people. And that's why I think that uh, these are the people of God. And it is going to work out. 
What is your prayer going to be on Sunday? Hopefully that everything works out right for us, really, because like the father says, I like to go back uh, a step, and we do raise money. We raise money through selling hats and bake sales and et cetera, and all the ways down the line. We raise money because we need money bad, so for advertisement, you know, and then we're taking trips. We want our congressmen and our senators and even the man in the White House to know what we're up against. We want this country to develop again. It is down on its knees, and that's why we are having a prayer Sunday. All right, thank you for joining us today on News 9 Index. Gentlemen, we thank you for being here today, and we hope that your project is a success. My prayers will be with you. One last thing, what's your prayer? I pray that everybody doesn't have to go through the same problem as LTV employees and retirees have to. That is my biggest prayer. Thank you, gentlemen. Join us again for News 9 Index.